Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight. We can't live in a world where a minor traffic offense results in someone being shot and killed. New video shows the graphic police killing of Anthony Alvarez on Chicago's northwest side last month. What we know and don't know about the shooting. We as the Latino community are heartbroken. Plus, reaction from Alvarez's family on the shooting, as well as renewed calls for changes to CPD's foot pursuit policy. Right now, it looks like they're just saying no. The governor's fighting words with the GOP is a focus of tonight's Spotlight Politics. He certainly recognizes the important opportunity that this offers. President Biden marks 100 days in office with a formal address to Congress. Find out what longtime political speechwriters expect to hear. More than 20 public officials are joining together to create a Mama's Caucus. We talk with its co-founders about what's at the top of their agenda. And a team of researchers look for clues in historic paintings at a museum in Pilsen. But first off tonight, city officials are again releasing video of a fatal police shooting. This time of 22-year-old Anthony Alvarez. He was shot and killed by a Chicago police officer on March 31st. The video released today shows an officer shooting at Alvarez multiple times on the front yard of a home in the 5200 block of West Eddy Street in Portage Park. The department's preliminary statement on the shooting did not state what sparked the foot pursuit, but Mayor Lori Lightfoot this morning implied that it involved a minor traffic offense. A few notes about our policy for showing this video, which was released by the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA. It's the same rationale we expressed to you a couple weeks ago when we presented the shooting video of 13-year-old Adam Toledo. We feel it's important for the public to be able to see exactly what's been released. Now, we'll be showing it a few times this evening as it helps to inform the discussions we'll be having about this story. This video is graphic and difficult to watch. Indeed, you will see Alvarez shot to death. We are only playing extended clips of this video tonight because we feel it's important to show what happened but we won't be using it in full otherwise. Now we start with about two minutes of video, beginning with the foot chase. Initially, you will see the event from the shooting officer's perspective, his body camera. Later, you'll notice we switch to the body cam from the other officer on the scene and back, and we've edited this in real time. Again, a warning, this video is graphic and disturbing. You see that officer there, he attempts to apply a tourniquet to Alvarez. Police released their own edited version of the video, and as we did two weeks ago, we'll show you a portion of that. Again, the markings on the video and the slow motion were made by the Chicago Police Department, not us. Again, this video is graphic and disturbing to watch. So we start with uh, the police department video showing that gas station there at the corner of uh, Laramie, a parking lot. You'll see Alvarez on the right side of your screen with a police unit, lights on, following him. 
there's a chase through an alley after this, but then we end up in this uh, the yard here in front of this home. The police department has slowed the video down here. You see an officer raising his weapon. And they, they did that because the police department wanted to point to this moment right here. There's an arrow pointing to a gun in Alvarez's right hand, his cell phone in his left hand. Um, security uh, camera video from one of those houses shows him running across the yard um, towards those stairs. Shots are fired and they're pointing to again the firearm that's in his right hand um, as Alvarez falls to the ground after being shot several times by police officer's bullet. And again, that video points to where that weapon landed uh, a couple of feet from Alvarez where he fell to the ground there. So. The CPD and the Civilian Office of Police Accountability re released these videos earlier this morning, and it's been nearly a month since the actual incident occurred. Anthony Alvarez's family members say they are, of course, overcome with grief. Amanda Venicky joins us now from outside the CPD headquarters. Amanda, what are we hearing from the family? What are they saying? Well, yes, Brandis, Anthony Alvarez, as you noted, 22 years old, have died March 31st. And by the way, that was just two days after a Chicago police officer shot and killed 13-year-old Adam Toledo. And in a statement released by attorneys representing the Alvarez family, they say they want to realize that Anthony Alvarez was more than a victim of a police shooting. He had just bought a new car. He was a great soccer player. But instead of pursuing that, he went to work at a local meat packing plant upon learning that his girlfriend was pregnant and they do say that he was a doting father of his now two year old girl. I can't believe he is gone. I really miss my son. I just want some answers. Why did they do this to Anthony? His father asks in a statement. Now among those questions that the family is asking what provoked police to chase Alvarez in the first place? We got few answers today from Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown, who says that he can't say much due to this being an ongoing investigation. I have to stay uh, non-opinionated on facts until I get that complete investigation. It's really important. He says it's important for the sake of transparency and because he will ultimately have to decide whether COPA's decision on whether officer, the officer who fought, uh, who fired that trio of shots, that's Evan Solano, whether Solano was justified in his actions that night on March 31st. While we did not get many answers from Brown, Mayor Lori Lightfoot this morning indicated that this followed some sort of minor traffic offense where a minor traffic offense results in someone being shot and killed. That's not acceptable to me, and it shouldn't be acceptable to anyone. Um, and again, this shooting involved a foot chase. Um, the department is making progress on my directive uh, to revise uh, the foot chase policy. There had also been an on-foot pursuit leading to the fatal shooting of Adam Toledo. The mayor afterward called on the CPD to get a foot chase policy enacted by this summer. Now, CPD Chief Brown says that the department is working diligently on that, having conversations with the consent decree independent monitor, with the community, and that he hopes to rule out that new policy within weeks. We are. Uh, obviously, uh, proceeding with a sense of urgency as it relates to foot pursuit policies and to highlight, obviously, the dangers uh, not only to officers, the general public and offenders fleeing. So it, it really is important for us to get it right. In a statement responding to the video, the AC of L ACLU of Illinois said the lack of meaningful police reform in Chicago is not only costing the city lives, but also taking a psychological toll on communities of color. The city must abandon the current snail's pace of police reform and become serious about making real changes that serve all neighborhoods. Now, that video has likewise intensified calls from other advocates for change, including a group of Latino attorneys and legal organizations that are seeking the Department of Justice, the U.S. DOJ, to investigate Toledo's death. Attorney Arturo Ho Rigi says this was another heartbreaking, needless tragedy, and he says that this is caused after a pattern of disinvestment in Latino communities. We cannot allow the Chicago Police Department to investigate itself. 
because it has not worked in the past and it's not going to work in the future. We need transparency. We need to establish trust between the Latino community and the police department. The shooting of Alvarez was not justified, he says, noting that Anthony Alvarez was fleeing, that his back was turned when he was shot. And he points out that in the video, when you hear Alvarez in his dying words asking why he was shot, the officer responds, because you had a gun. And if that's going to be the standard by which uh, cops in Chicago are going to be shooting anyone that has a gun, then I think the NRA uh, needs to send out an immediate uh, notice to their members and say, look, you might want to leave your gun at home. Don't go out there with your gun uh, because you're going to get shot if you're carrying a gun in the city of Chicago. Now, Alderman Ariel Rebroya represents the part of Portage Park where the shooting took place, and he says nobody wants to see someone killed. And he says all officials, yes, including the mayor, are working to prevent situations like these. He says he is going to wait for that investigation by COPA to play out. But every situation is different. You cannot say, well, if we would have done this, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, I, I can't speak for that because a police officer is trained, a police officer is looking out for all the lives, everyone's lives, in, in, including theirs. Now, relatives, friends, activists, neighbors held a vigil for Anthony Alvarez last Friday. Broya says that beforehand, he went door to door along the block where the shooting took place. Some came out, some spoke to you, some didn't. Uh, others didn't answer. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're in shock, uh, rightfully so. He places a large portion on, of the blame on the proliferation of guns coming in from neighboring Indiana. That's where the problem lies. I think Congress needs to do something. They need to do something fast about that. It doesn't answer for everything, but it, that's, 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 that's something that's been talked about, but nothing has been done. He, the mayor, as well as the Alvarez family have said that if there are to be any demonstrations or protests in the name of Alvarez, they ask, they plead really that they be peaceful. Now, the Alvarez family also saying that it does have faith that COPA and the Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox will investigate, investigate this situation thoroughly, but they also say that they are demanding answers to those outstanding questions. Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to Paris for more reaction to the shooting. Paris. Brandis, as we just heard Amanda report, there are still so many unknowns about the police shooting of Anthony Alvarez last month, including why he was stopped by police in the first place. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, has recommended the officer who shot Alvarez be relieved of his police powers while the shooting is under investigation. But Police Chief David Brown has yet to act on that recommendation and refused to comment much at all about the case until the investigation is complete. Joining us now with more are Jamie Calvin, founder investigative reporter at the Invisible Institute. His reporting was instrumental in bringing attention to the 2014 police shooting of Laquan McDonald. And Sharon Fairley, a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. She previously served as chief administrator of the Independent Police Review Authority, or IPRA, and that is the agency that preceded COPA. Welcome both of you back to Chicago tonight. Sharon Farrelly, uh, the video you saw, the evidence you've seen released so far, your initial reactions. Well, of course, it's, the initial reaction is, is it's just a huge tragedy. It's, it's incredibly upsetting and really it's just it's a tragedy. Uh, it's, it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch. It's hard to see just another example of a foot pursuit being ended in a fatal encounter. Jamie Calvin, um, you've reported on this. The mayor said uh, something about a traffic incident, but the police won't really talk about the circumstances regarding why police were chasing Anthony Alvarez down. Do you know any more than, than what the public's been privy to so far? I don't. I, uh, all that we've heard is actually the mayor's remark. Uh, there was nothing, as I think you noted in your setup piece, there was nothing in the initial statement from the police department about the incident as to why he was stopped. You know, as you uh, saw in the in the video footage from the gas station, 
you know, he's he's walking with what appear to be two bags of, of groceries. The police approach him very aggressively. You know, the car sort of swoops in. He takes off. We know nothing about the reason that the police um, came at him. And I think, you know, I think my overwhelming reaction to this as to so many of the fatal police shootings that we've seen around the country is, did this need to happen at all? You know, think about all the incidents that were set in motion by essentially trivial law enforcement occasions. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things, and, and the mayor has spoken to this, that we need to really be focused on here is a mode of policing that keeps manufacturing the so-called split second in which the police have to decide whether to use uh, deadly force. And I want to get to that. Split yeah. I, and I want to get to more of that, especially foot pursuit policy. But Sharon, you know, as someone who reviewed many of these cases as the head of IPRA, when you see uh, someone, a victim or suspect, whatever you call it in this case, with a gun, uh, is, it, is, is it hard to make the case that there should be some kind of punitive action against the police officer? Well, so we, we know that two things. We know that a police officer does not have to wait to be staring until he's staring down the barrel of a gun to defend himself. But we also know that a police officer cannot just shoot an individual merely because they possess a firearm. And so we've got to figure out what happened here to see if there's something in the middle. So if you look at other uh, foot pursuit policies, for example, they actually say, if you look at Houston's policy, for example, they say, if there's someone with a gun, we, we might want to, instead of going forward with a chase, we might want to just lay back and uh, do more of a containment approach, a surveillance and containment approach. So, so we have to sort of look at this from a policy perspective and understand whether or not we're telling officers to, you know, what to do in these situations and if, if it's appropriate or not. And Jamie Calvin, you're the mayor say and the police superintendent say they're going to come up with some kind of uh, uh, foot pursuit policy. Is that the policy, the one uh, Sharon Fairley just mentioned? Is, the, is that a better policy for a CPD to use? Certainly, that would be that would be an improvement. I mean, this is this is overdue. This has been noted, um, you know, since the police accountability task force in, in 2016 that the the mayor, the current mayor, was the chair of. This has been identified again and again and again as a problem. So we, I think we have to call for. We talk about police accountability. I think there's a, a mode of political accountability we need to call for. We have some patterns and practices, long identified, diagnosed, things that are fixable and haven't been fixed. I, I appreciate the urgency with which this is being talked about now. And I think that the, the critical thing, and it applies beyond foot pursuit, it applies to traffic stops and a number of other um, sorts of police practices, is to reduce the number of interactions between police and uh, community members that serve no purpose and can be counterproductive that you know are alienating for people at best and risk these catastrophic outcomes at worst it, you know that's the first order of business so a foot pursuit policy that meant that there were you know fewer occasions like this one um, would be would be a significant improvement, but I think that's the principle we should be applying to all sorts of police interactions. And, now. I, I want I want to keep on this because this calls to mind a case that happened right after Laquan McDonald several years ago. Ronnie Johnson, a shooting similar. He's running away. He has a gun. He's shot, and and the, and the shooting was ruled justified. And, and one of the justifications was that he's a danger to the community uh, if he's resisting arrest and running away with a, a gun. Do you see similarities uh, between that case and this case, Sharon Fairley? Well, I think you know we the, the reason why it was considered that in that and that at that time was the the, poli the certainly the Chicago Police Department policy was different then, and it's based on the law that. A, a, a police officer can be justified in using deadly force against someone who is fleeing by the use of a deadly weapon. Um, and so that, that's a question that comes up a lot in the context of these foot pursuits. Uh, under the law uh, here in Illinois, that, that is permissible. Now, currently, the, the, the current Chicago Police Department policy, which was not in effect then, says that that's not the case, that a person must present an imminent threat to the officer or someone else in order for the officer to be justified in the use of deadly force. So the current policy is, is more stringent. So, so that case might have gone differently under the current policy. Jamie Calvin, uh, 
it mentioned before, this is happening as the police is uh, working to comply with a federal consent decree. That stems from the police shooting of uh, Laquan McDonald. What does it tell you that this is happening so often despite these efforts at reform? Yeah, I mean, I think it just is something that um, I almost want to say we need to be ashamed of. You know, it's it's now how many years since the revelations in the Laquan McDonald case produced a sense that police reform was the most urgent priority in the city. And here we are. And, you know, as I said, the, the issue of foot pursuits, the issue of, um, you know, ex frequent and excessive use of force by the department has been thoroughly diagnosed. So where is the, the political will? Where is the clarity of purpose? to address these things. And, and the key here, I think, for people to understand is every day that we don't address the problems that are within our power to, to um, ameliorate, we create more Anthony Alvarez's. We don't know what their names will be tomorrow and the next day, but we know that these are predictable outcomes if we don't alter the mode of policing that um, you know is is practiced in black and brown communities in this city, and and it winds up producing more of these videos that I know uh, rock uh, the conscience of of the public and folks watching. And our thanks to Jamie Calvin and Sharon Fairley. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks. Thank you. And up next, a caucus of mothers. What's at the top of their agenda? Stay with us to find out. No matter what side of the political aisle they may stand on, there is one thing many women in government have in common, motherhood. That's why more than 20 city, state, and county government officials have come together to form the bipartisan Mamas Caucus to tackle issues specific to mothers. It comes as the COVID pandemic has compounded the challenges women face at work and at home, forcing some to leave the workplace entirely in order to care for their children. Joining us now to talk about it are two of the group's co-founders, State Representative Avery Bourne, a Republican who represents parts of central Illinois. She also serves as the assistant Republican leader in the House. And City Treasurer Melissa Conyers Irvin, a Democrat who previously served as a state representative. Moms, mothers, thanks to you both for joining us. Um, so Representative Bourne, let's start with you, please. Why did you and the other founders want to create this caucus? I think it's really important right now, especially when I think in politics we're so polarized to find an issue of commonality and build on that. Uh, you know, I think moms get a lot done. We certainly have a lot to get done and to start at the place where we can connect, which is motherhood, I think uh, is a good starting point. And really I've enjoyed getting to know these moms. Now we're gonna get to hear from moms on what they need from government and from policymakers. Treasurer Conyers Irvin, explain or describe, please, some of the challenges that you've faced navigating motherhood and your work as an elected official, which is different um, compared to the rest of us working moms. Yes, and so, Brandis, to your point, it's it's a challenge just being a working mother, right? And so, it's a challenge just being a mother. <laughs> and right. when I think about as a mother, our our child or children, those are our babies. But as an elected official, sometimes we feel as if our roles, um, it, the job is another child. And I think that it's almost like a child that never sleeps as an elected official because we are working all day, sometimes late in the evening, weekends, you name it. We do it because we love it. Um, but we also know that support is needed especially if we want more mothers to run for office. Um, that's why I am such an advocate of this caucus and so excited that we are able to put this together. Representative Bourne, what's your experience been as both a mother and a lawmaker? Sure. You know, I started out as an elected official, not as a mom. And so adding that layer to it, I think added some challenges, but it also helps me appreciate uh, the gravity of the work that we do. Anyone who uh, is a parent understands that everything changes when you have a child and you understand 
uh, the impact these policy decisions will make generations to come. And so certainly, uh, as Melissa said, juggling children is always, uh, always adds another layer, but uh, motherhood is such a blessing and being able to uh, look out for that next generation and have a different perspective, I think is really valuable for people who hold public office. Right, and as each of you were speaking, we were able to share some photos of you with your kids on the job, you know, uh, whether it be, you know, on the House floor or um, other members of the caucus while they are out campaigning or uh, working with constituents. Uh, Treasurer Conyers Irvin, talk a little bit about the significance of this caucus forming at this moment in time, knowing the impact of the pandemic um, on mothers uh, in, the work uh, in the workplace. I think the pandemic definitely made us more aware of what we already knew as mothers. First of all, women do it all and we do it well. <laughs> but we need support, which is really the purpose of this caucus. Um, when you, you, you open the segment speaking about how many women have left the workforce during this pandemic, I think over 2 million women left the workforce during this pandemic. Very devastating numbers, Brandis. But that really tells us that something is wrong. And I would argue that probably most of the women that left the workforce were mothers. So not only the demand of our regular jobs, but with the demand of our children and demands of our spouses and families, the pandemic just truly exposed that. So what I appreciate about this Mama's Caucus, and by the way, we are excited about this coming Saturday. I know we're going to talk about that. But what I appreciated is that we have mothers at all levels of government and it's bipartisan because at the end of the day, um, all mamas are not Republicans, all mamas are not Democrats, all mamas are not independent. And well, if we and really, independence, and if we really want to focus on the issues of mamas, this is what it's all about. And to that point, Representative Bourne, um, I'm curious about how you all are going to be able to work, you know, across the agencies. Um, you know, some of you are, you know, city uh, officials, obviously state representatives. So um, kind of what's at the top of the agenda and how is that going to work across, you know, the different agencies and positions that you all hold? Yeah, I think that our first priority is listening. So there are policies that are made at every level from federal right, right on down to your most local governmental body that impact people's lives every day. And so I think our first agenda item is listening. What's impacting moms' lives the most? What can we do to make Illinois the most mom-friendly state? And then what venue does that fall under? Does that fall to us in the General Assembly? Does it fall to the city? Does it fall to local municipalities? Um, where do we need to do that work? I think we'll get a better picture after we hear from the moms. And uh, one of the things, or, you know, as uh, Treasurer Irvin mentioned, you're having this town hall on Saturday, focusing on employment, child care, self-care. Um, in the 20 seconds that we've got left, Treasurer, why are those your top three issues to begin with? There are a million issues that we could can, that we could speak about this coming Saturday. And please, by the way, register at mamascaucus.org. We want mothers at all throughout the state to register for this event. And as, as Representative Bourne said, this is just the beginning. So we chose those three topics, three very common topics that we know have affected all mothers throughout this pandemic. And so self-care, employment, that we spoke about already, child care that we know has been an issue during this pandemic. Right. Very important topics that we All plan three. on listening okay. this All coming three. Saturday during our lunch. All three very good places to start, and I look forward to hearing more from the Mama's Caucus down the road. For now, uh, my thanks to State Representative Avery Bourne and City Treasurer Melissa conyers Irvin for joining us. And now, Paris, we toss it back to you. Thanks, Brandis. And there is much more ahead on the program, including a preview of President Biden's speech to Congress tonight. But first, scientists in Pilsen are currently exploring centuries-old paintings from colonial-era Mexico. They're searching for clues to find out more about this artwork. Chicago Tonight's Mark Vitale visited the National Museum of Mexican Art for a meetup of art and science. The museum has been closed to the public for more than a year, but the staff stays busy. Right now, they're assisting visiting scientists who hope to discover new information about some curious canvases. We have the incredible privilege of being able to look into the past of some of our pieces from the collection. So we have taken them down from the, the permanent exhibition here at the National Museum of Mexican Art, and we've taken them across the hall into a temporary laboratory where they are being examined 
and they're being uh, scrutinized to see what their true story may be. Like this Virgin of Guadalupe, the paintings are devotional images of Christianity, most of them from the 18th century. In Mexico, the colonial era uh, ends technically at the, as soon as Mexico becomes a republic. So uh, 1810 is usually the cutoff date. Pieces that are being examined, uh, we believe, are from the colonial era or right around there and certainly feature ideas, concepts, beliefs from that time period. Researchers are collecting data with a combination of hyperspectral imaging and X-ray fluorescence. The mobile lab was set up by the Center for Scientific Studies in the Arts, a collaboration between Northwestern University and the Art Institute of Chicago. It's something that the center is really designed to do, to travel to museums and uh, various institutions to provide technical and analytical support where there is otherwise no opportunity to do so. And today we're here midway through our campaign with the National Museum of Mexican Art looking at six colonial paintings to understand a lot more about the history of our production at this time uh, in Mexico. They hope to find out what kind of pigments were used and whether they were European made or indigenous. And they've been showing us some areas that have genuine gold in them. They're finding copper in some of the greens. Also, they'll be looking for what's called pedimiento, which is um, it's a, a nice, beautiful Italian word for how an artist changes their mind in the design of a piece. Like maybe they started with a certain sketch, and then they painted over that. The science team also views their museum trip as a kind of outreach project. It is indeed a scientific study, but there is a a broader scope which is to bring science and science for art to to a, a wider audience which is always very nice for us scientists. They're still in the data collecting phase. A full report will come later. What follows from this trip is a lot of post-production, so a lot of analysis of the results, so interpretation of the results, conversations back and forth with the folks here. This is sort of like a genealogy project of the works of art. We're gonna take a look at our our treasures, our cultural treasures that we have, and uh, really see where, where they came from and, and what their history, what their past was. Uh, and of course, that will just add so much more to the stories of our community, whether it's here in Chicago or in, in Mexico. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The work wraps up this week, and we'll update the story when the findings of the report are released later this year. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, President Biden addresses a joint session of Congress, but the crowd will be pared down. Political speechwriters weigh in on the promises and pitfalls. Right now it looks like they're just saying no. And the governor pointing fingers at the GOP, the focus of our spotlight politics. But first, another look at today's top story. Earlier in the program, we showed you the just-released video of the police shooting of Anthony Alvarez. The video released today shows an officer shooting at Alvarez multiple times on the front yard of a home in the 5200 block of West Eddy Street in Portage Park. The department's preliminary statement on the shooting did not say what sparked that foot pursuit, but Mayor Lori Lightfoot this morning implied that it involved a minor traffic offense. Now, we feel it's important for the public to be able to see an extended clip of this video. As we mentioned earlier, it is graphic and difficult to watch. You will see 22-year-old Anthony Alvarez shot to death. We're only playing this extended clip tonight because we feel it's important to show what happened, but we will not be using it in full otherwise. Now, here is uh, almost two minutes of video beginning with that chase. Initially, you'll see the event from the shooting officer's body camera. Later, you'll notice we switch to the body cam from the other officer on that scene and then back. And we've edited, edited this in real time. Stop, 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 stop. I'm gonna run the race. I'm gonna die. 
The officer then attempts to apply a tourniquet to Alvarez, uh, other officers, and he also administered chest compressions and CPR. The 22-year-old died that night. And you can read much more on this story on our website, wttw.com news. And we'll have more on this later on in the program during Spotlight Politics. And now to Paris for a preview of the president's speech tonight. Paris. Prentice, in less than an hour, President Joe Biden will address a joint session of Congress to mark 100 days since taking office and to pitch some of his sweeping legislative proposals. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki gave a preview of what Biden might say to the pared down and masked audience. Well, the major policy announcement in the speech is, of course, the American Families Plan, a historic investment in education and child care. He will also use the speech as an opportunity to talk about many of his other priorities, including police reform, immigration, gun safety, his ongoing work to get the pandemic under control, and to putting Americans back to work. And joining us now are Mari Masing Will, principal of Masing Communications and a political advisor and speechwriter for numerous Republican politicians, and Jason DeSanto, senior lecturer at Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law and a speechwriter and debate advisor for many Democratic politicians. Great to have both of you back here. Uh, Jason, I want to talk about the optics here. A speech in front of a sparsely populated room, socially distant, wearing masks, many Republicans saying they will not be in attendance, and a Capitol still reeling from what happened there on January 6th. How does all of this play in to what viewers will see on TV tonight? Well, they're going to see a very different spectacle, and it usually is a spectacle, a joint session. We think about these as State of the Union addresses typically, but the joint session speech has taken on kind of this first year of the presidency motif where it, it acts like a State of the Union address, but it's not really called one. And usually we're thinking about 1,600 people that are present for that. This time they're going to be about 200. The dynamics are going to be different. People are going to be spread out. The room is going to be emptier. Just from an auditory perspective, that's going to be a little bit different for Joe Biden. And in terms of what we're going to see at home, in terms of the shots that we're going to see of reactions, but ultimately... The name of the game here is the ability to, at one moment in time, talk about the past, the present, and chart a course for the future. That's what these speeches do. That's still the goal, and that's what Joe Biden's going to try to do tonight. Uh, Mari Masing, Will, you heard Jen Psaki talk about uh, this $1.8 trillion investment uh, called the American Families Plan, uh, funding things like universal preschool, health care, free community college. Would you expect here a policy-laden speech? Well, that's unfortunately what it... It usually turns out to be these speeches are easy to give because you have a teleprompter, but a nightmare to write and very often hard to endure. It's a challenge for the speechwriter to try to keep it a coherent whole because you just heard the laundry list of things that Jen said that they were going to try to include. The speechwriter basically battles against everybody who has an idea in the West Wing and the cabinet agencies uh, for, to include in there. I, I am hoping, however, that um, that it won't be as much that as it will be uh, the president seizing this optimistic moment in America, where I think most people are feeling good right now. Everyone who can wants to be vaccinated can be. People are feeling free. They can hug each other again. They're going back to work, and there's and it's springtime, and and I think that if he were to bond with that moment and give an aspirational speech, 
rather than a detailed policy speech, you have to go through some of it and check the boxes. But if it were, was about the America that he wanted to see again, and, and even a better America than we've ever had before, that would be a moment that I think would help his personal popularity and his presence. So, so a hope springs eternal peace. Jason DeSanto, one of the things the president did want to see was bipartisanship in the country. He's, he's, he's tried to walk that line, although Republicans say bipartisanship is nowhere to be found. Do you think he will try to persuade the country, persuade Republicans that we are entering a bipartisan moment? I think he's going to try to persuade Americans that he's acting in a way where he's listening and where he has an arm outstretched. I do think rhetorically what he's probably going to have to do is demonstrate two things. First of all, that his proposals are a matter of common sense and are in step with the American people, and particularly with the middle class. So that's a challenge rhetorically. And at the same time, demonstrate that Republicans who are in Congress are acting in a way which is more ideological and which is not really ready to find common ground. And in that way, what he's going to have to do, Paris, really, is try to separate, as he's tried to do in some other appearances, Republican leadership, Republican representatives and senators from Republicans in the country and make the argument that his, his plans are popular, that he has 69% approval ratings on handling the pandemic. He won't cite that number specifically, but he knows that. And he also knows he has a majority of Americans who are in favor broadly of his economic stewardship. I think what he's gonna try to demonstrate is what he is advocating is in step with people, not with the Republicans themselves. And that's a debate they're gonna be having over the next few weeks when he's done tonight. And Mari Mossing, well, you've heard Republicans not so much seize on all this big spending that the government is undertaking, but focusing more on things like the border, culture war issues, Dr. Seuss. We're going to have uh, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott give the rebuttal. Is that the kind of thing you would expect in that speech? Oh, no. Tim Scott is uh, one of the most liked senators uh, in that chamber. He's uh, very smart, uh, but he's also affable. And he is interested in bipartisan, working in a bipartisan way. Um, he had introduced previously, for example, um, justice reform. And he's very interested in that. I actually think, I, I disagree just a little bit with Jason here. I don't think the president should attack the, uh, the Republican members of Congress. If I were him, I would not attack anybody. I would try to, t I would just talk about what I wanted to achieve. And I think there's a big intersection in the Venn diagram between Republicans and uh, Democrats in some of these core issues like police reform, justice reform, immigration reform. And uh, he's got a little bit of a free pass on his economic proposal since the Republicans spent like crazy during the last administration. So they're trying to get their theory of governance back together. But I think, I, I was very encouraged to hear this afternoon that he might think about breaking apart immigration uh, reform into smaller pieces, because I think um, uh, making uh, the uh, children who came here uh, uh, not according to their own will, the DACA, young people, make, make, uh, enabling them to become Americans right away. I, I, I think that there is a, that's an 80% issue in the United States. If you could take things like that piece by piece, the rest of it will have to be negotiated. But I think most Americans want eventually there to be a pathway for citizenship. And I think it would be good for the Republican Party to compromise on some of these issues. I think it's out there. I think that's what Tim Scott will try to talk about. Uh, at least I hope it is. I hope that he will also pre present uh, a more harmonious, optimistic possibility for America. All right. Always great insights from both of you, but we are out of time. Our thanks to Mari Massingwill and Jason DeSanto. And up next, our Spotlight Politics team dives into the details of the police shooting of Anthony Alvarez. But first, we take a look at the weather. <laughs> Another police-involved shooting, this time of Anthony Alvarez, right on the heels of video released showing the death of 13-year-old Adam Toledo. 
That is the focus of tonight's Spotlight Politics. Here with that and more are WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson, who has been covering the Alvarez shooting, along with Heather Sharon, Amanda Vinicky, and Paris Schutz. Um, so, gang, we're, we're not going to show the video of that police shooting of Anthony Alvarez in full again, but we are going to show the foot chase that preceded that shooting. Uh, Paris, walk us through a bit of what we're seeing here. Uh, well, so, so here's this is the body cam uh, footage uh, of the police officer chasing down uh, Mr. Alvarez, rounding the corner. There's Mr. Alvarez, and right there is where the shots happen. Now you're seeing surveillance footage from the house that again show it's a better angle of Alvarez with the gun. So apparently, allegedly, a gun in his right hand. And, and here you go, the, the body cam footage again from the witness cop, the second cop that was following this. And, you know, the slowed down part here, there's the arrow. This, this, is, this is CPD doctored footage here. And they did this with the Adam Toledo case because they're trying to sort of paint a picture here of all the circumstances that surrounded what happened um, that, uh, that the police officer was facing in that moment, that apparently Mr. Alvarez had a gun. Uh, and, you know, this, this is sort of the case that they will make, um, you know, as COPA investigates here and the state's attorney decides whether to investigate well, whether this was a wrongful shooting or not. Uh, Matt. Welcome to Spotlight Politics. Um, Mayor Lightfoot said that this should not have happened after a routine traffic stop. What more do we know about that? That's kind of the big question right now. That was the biggest window we got into what preceded this uh, foot chase was the statement from Mayor Lori Lightfoot this morning that uh, this involved some sort of minor traffic offense. But the videos that we saw, the surveillance footage showed us uh, Anthony Alvarez walking through a gas station parking lot. He wasn't in a car. He wasn't around a car and the, the police vehicle that started chasing him came right through the parking lot as he was walking. So it's not exactly clear right now what the mayor was referring to. Um, police officials have recognized that the officers involved, they, they recognized Alvarez, they said, but they have, didn't elaborate on that. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability has said that Alvarez was familiar to police as well, but we don't have a full explanation for why that is right now. Um, police Superintendent David Brown spoke a little bit on this today, but he declined to give any insight into what preceded this at all um, while COPA's investigation is still going on. And the mayor issued another statement this afternoon um, that, again, referred to a minor and inconsequential incident, but didn't give any background on what exactly happened before this. And Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown, as you said, he did speak to the media after the video of the foot chase was released. Um, here is what some of what he and Mayor Lightfoot said today. This shooting involved a foot chase. Um, the department is making progress on my directive uh, to revise uh, the foot chase policy. As I've said before, it's one of the most dangerous activities that officers engage in. We hope to roll out and implement the foot pursuit policy within the next uh, few weeks. So two videos of police involved shootings uh, released within a few weeks, both involving foot chases. Heather, what, if anything, is happening to change that foot pursuit policy? Well, we only know what we heard today. Those discussions are going on behind the scenes, and we are obviously not privy to them. But this is not as simple as sending a memo to all of the department's police officers. This policy not only has to pass muster with the superintendent and the mayor, but it also has to be approved by the team that's implementing the federal court order that requires the Chicago Police Department to reform. So that is another level of scrutiny that this new policy will have to meet but this is not something that should have caught anybody involved off guard uh, the city has known since 2017 that, that foot chases are very deadly and that they were encouraged by the department of justice to put a policy in place however nothing was done until uh, adam toledo was killed i'm really i'm sorry can i jump in re really quick because i said something before and i want to clarify it. i said that that cpd footage was doctored Doctor kind of assumes something nefarious. It, doctor is probably not the right word. It was it was enhanced, let's say, with that arrow, was slowing it down to again try to sort of paint a full narrative of of what the police officer is seeing. Fair point, Paris. Thank you, um, Matt. What do we know about the status of the officer now? For now, he remains on the typical 30-day administrative leave that all officers are placed on after a shooting. Um, COPA, the, which is still investigating the shooting, has said that the police department should go a step further with that. They recommended today that the officer should be relieved of his police powers, not only for the 30 days, but throughout the duration of its ongoing investigation. So much longer than that 30-day window, presumably. 
Um, COPA said that recommendation was based on information that it has already obtained in the early stages of this investigation, going back the last few weeks since the shooting occurred. Um, as of this afternoon, we've been told that Superintendent Brown is aware of that recommendation and he's taking it under advisement. But to this point, they have not said if he's actually been stripped of his police powers. Okay. And Heather, do we know yet why not? Why that hasn't been done? Well, we don't. And David Brown is under no obligation to accept COPA's recommendation. And he really has the sole power to decide whether this police officer should keep his police powers and his badge and whether he should return to duty as soon as uh, 48 hours from now. Tomorrow is also the day that the officer who shot and killed Adam Toledo is scheduled to end his routine 30 day administrative leave. So I will certainly be asking whether that officer will return to duty as he is scheduled to do. Okay. So uh, shifting to state politics, Illinois is poised to lose one House seat in Congress with the release of the latest census data. Meanwhile, as lawmakers in the General Assembly are hammering out a new map, Governor J.B. Pritzker urges legislators to work together. Take a look. Well, as I've said, I will veto an unfair map. I do believe that Democrats and Republicans should get together to adopt this map. I hope that Republicans will choose to work with Democrats on the map right now. It looks like they're just saying no. So, Amanda, did, did the governor break his promise? Yes. <laughs> when he was a candidate, he was asked in a survey by Capital Facts. This is a prominent political insider's blog directly asked the Democratic candidates, probably the Republicans too, <laughs> for governor what they would do if they were given a map that was drawn either by the legislative leaders, legislators themselves, their allies, and Pritzker said yes, he would veto a map that was drawn by legislators. He has most certainly changed his tune. He's now saying that, well, they didn't pass a constitutional amendment to do that. but. Very well, the, the power lies within the legislature to decide how they want to do this. They could have a bipartisan panel. So yes, he is most definitely backtracking on his word. And I, I think what he's doing is sort of making the calculus that any backlash he's going to get in the media or from Republicans is well worth it, either because of allowing Democrats to draw a map that is within their favor, helps out his party, and also because it is so important to legislators what that map look like looks like he does not want to raise any ire within the general assembly that he wants to work along with him to get his agenda passed before he runs for re-election statewide paris don't the spoils go to the victor traditionally that's how it worked but there's also the national aspect here that governor pritzker is aware of is that uh, redistricting gerrymandering is going to happen in red states and blue states so in a state like illinois the map will be probably more disproportionately in favor of Democrats than the population. But in states like Wisconsin, North Carolina, Texas, it'll be the other way around. And you have Democrat, you have the House, which is very, uh, Democrats have a tenuous advantage in the House and a 50-50 split in the Senate. So every single seat here in this remap counts. And I'm sure the governor is aware of that. So uh, on the pandemic front, uh, demand for shots, is that slowing down, Amanda? Um, and if so, how else is the city getting creative to boost vaccine participation? It does appear as if it is slowing down. We knew that we would get to this point in the city of Chicago and elsewhere, and it appears as if we are reaching it. The city trying to do something about that with this vaccine passport that could perhaps give people uh, some perks, better seats at concerts, if and when we actually have any sort of concerts. And also, I think it's called Vax Relax. So I'm um, trying to get people to not just entice them with the stick, the fear of getting the coronavirus and spreading it to loved ones, but also a bit of a carrot. <laughs> All right. Um, and Heather, briefly, United Center is uh, closing to walk-in appointments starting on May 11th. What, what's that about? Well, it is part of the shift to managing the surging demand that the city really couldn't accommodate for COVID-19 vaccines to encouraging people who are more reluctant or a little bit more hesitant to get the shot and to really meet them where they are. So that whole thing will change. It is going to be a regional approach uh, through each part of the city. The city's got a bunch of money that it has from the federal government that it's going to give to community organizations to do that work. So the idea is don't you won't have 
have to go to the United Center, but maybe you'll get your shot at a laundromat or a library or something in your neighborhood, somewhere where you can talk to somebody, especially if you've got questions, rather than the huge United Center operation. Okay, that's Spotlight Politics. Thanks to the team, Matt Masterson, Heather Sharon, Amanda Venicky, and of course, Paris. And you can find more about the stories discussed tonight with our Spotlight Politics team on our website. While, there, while you're there, you can find a Q&A on what to do with your COVID vaccination card. All of that is at WTTW.com news. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth joins us to discuss her new proposal to invest in the country's drinking water infrastructure. And harmonica lessons with Chicago blues legend Billy Branch. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe. Stay tuned for Biden's Address to the Nation. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all.